This is going to be Chapter 8 of Skink No Surrender by Carl Hyacin. Scientists search for ivory-billed woodpeckers with the same fanatic determination that some people hunt for Bigfoots. The difference is that those woodpeckers were real. They lived in old hardwood forests throughout the southern United States until after the Civil War when the timber industry moved in and started chopping down millions of trees. Eventually, the birds had no more bark beetles to eat, no old dead trunks for pecking out their nest holes. Once it became known that ivory bills were disappearing, they were stalked and shot by hunters who sold the bodies to museums so that they could be stuffed and put on display like dinosaurs. Pitiful, but true. The woodpecker was crazy beautiful, tall and long beaked with pale yellow eyes and bluish black feathers. Bright white streaks ran down each side of its neck, spreading to the wings. The bird's most striking feature was a sharp crest on the back of its head, black for females, bright red for males. The ivory bill's appearance was so dramatic that it was nicknamed the Lord God bird because Lord God is what people supposedly ex exclaimed when they first saw one. There hadn't been a 100% documented encounter with the species in something like 80 years. Random sightings are reported, but like Bigfoot, not a sing single ivory bill has been positively located and identified. What people often see and get excited about is really a pelated woodpecker, which also has a vivid red crest. That bird is smaller though, with brownish feathers and a shorter beak. It also has less white on the wing markings. I know all this from doing my science fair project, which won an honorable mention at school. I wouldn't call myself an ivory bill expert, but I did a ton of research. Because ivory bills vanished so long ago, no color photographs of the birds exist. Mally helped me draw a likeness on my poster board. To be accurate, we studied century old illustrations and also a painting of three ivory bills by James, John James Audubon, the famous nature artist who spent a lot of time in Florida. Unfortunately, Audubon usually shot the species he wanted to paint in order to examine them up close. This was back in the 1820s when there were still plenty of ivory bills around, but I bet today he'd trade that painting for a glimpse of a live one. The last known population was wiped out in the 1930s when a Chicago lumber company clear-cut an ancient Louisiana forest. Lots of folks, even some politicians, pleaded with the loggers not to saw down those trees, but the company refused to stop. And with that, the ivory-billed woodpecker became a ghost. In Florida, the legend lives on in the deep woods along the Chocodahatchee Chaka, River, which winds down into the panhandle from southern Alabama. Mally also worked with me on my habitat map. That's how she was able to get on the phone and tell me where she was without alerting the fake Talbo Chalk. All she had to do was say was that, say was that she'd heard an ivory bill. Only a bird geek like me would put two and two together. Not so long ago, researchers from two big-time universities published a study listing 14 reliable sightings of the ivory bill in the Chocotahatchee Basin, as well as 300 recordings of distinct calls and bark drumming known to be made by the elusive woodpecker. However, after several years of trying, no scientist or civilian has been able to produce a clear photo clear photographic evidence of a living specimen along that river or anywhere else in the United States. A famous video that supposedly shows an ivory bill flying in an Arkansas swamp was rejected by top or ornithologists who said the bird was most likely a pelated woodpecker. I included a YouTube clip of that video in my science fair project, which was interactive. People could touch a button and hear a recording that compared the different hammering patterns of the pelated and the ivory billed. I recreated the sounds myself by tapping a hollow bamboo reed against a dead palm tree. It would be awesome if someone actually discovered a live ivory bill, but that hasn't happened. The bird is officially classified as extinct, and that's what I concluded in my project. They're all gone. Don't be so sure, the governor said. Now you sound like my stepfather. He totally believes in Sasquatches. I saw one of those woodpeckers with my own eye. Right, I said. April 17th, 2009. Tomorrow I'll show you where. Chocotahatchee Bay, where the river empties, is only a short drive from Panama City, but Skink decided to wait until morning to begin our search for Mally. He said snooping around after dark was too risky. 
In the daylight hours, we could pose as grandfather and grandson on a lazy summer road trip. Don't you have, like, a regular hat? I asked. He smoothed the wrinkles from a shower cap and sourly jabbed a stick into the embers of the fire. We were camping in piney scrub near a place called Ebro. The governor was frying two dozen oysters he'd bought at a fish house and shucked with a combat knife. I've never been brave enough to eat an oyster, but I agreed to try one because my other option was boiled roadkill. Skink had scavenged a dead raccoon on Highway 98. It had been struck by a vehicle with extremely large tires, and the furry ring tail was the only way you could tell what kind of mammal it was. The oysters were actually tasty, and I ended up eating more than the governor did. After we finished, he gathered up the empty shells and went off to bury them. That's when my mother called. Where are you? She asked. I've got a road map of Florida in front of me. I can't tell you, but we're definitely getting close to Mally. Hold on. Did you really just say you can't tell me? I promised him I wouldn't give out too much information. By him, you mean Mr. Tyree. Has he legally adopted you now? Because if not, I'm still the one responsible for your health and well-being. Okay, Mom, okay. I told her we were camping in the Panhandle. She asked for the name of the nearest city, and I said we were somewhere west of Tallahassee. Oh, that's a tremendous help, Richard. You might as well have said east of Mobile. Mom, everything's fine. We had fresh oysters for dinner, okay? It's not like I'm suffering. He's got bug spray, blankets, soap, even a snake bite kit. Dumb mistake on my part, mentioning the snake bite kit. Oh, great. So you're in a wild swamp, my mother sighed, with moccasins and rattlers. We are not in a swamp. You gotta chill, please. Has he done anything crazy yet? Tell the truth. He cussed at some litter bug on the highway, I said. That's not crazy. You do the same thing. Except my mother had never poured beer into another driver's gas tank, no matter what stupid thing he's done. Trent got on the line to say how disappointed he was in me for lying about going camping with Blake. I apologized for getting him into trouble with Mom. He said, best thing you could do, bro, is beam yourself home ASAP. Not just yet. So let the cops find Mally. Where are you, like Mr. Secret Agent Bounty Hunter? What are you, like Mr. Sacred Agent Bounty Hunter? The difference was that bounty hunters chase down people to get the reward money. I was tracking my cousin because I was worried about her. Trent, can I please talk to mom again? There was a muffled exchange on the phone. Then my mother's tense voice said, Richard, if you do find Mally, I want your word that you and Mr. Tyree won't do anything reckless. Just hang back and call the police, all right? Don't try to be heroes. Of course, I said, knowing the governor was out of my control. He couldn't wait to have a chat with the fake Talbot. Also, Mom added, you've got exactly 72 hours. Why? What, then what? Then I'll be notifying the authorities. But what about Mr. What Mr. Tile? I'm telling him the same thing, she said. Three days from now, I expect to see your smiling, unharmed face in this house. If you're not back by then, I'm basically calling out the cavalry. Mom, come on. That's the deal, Richard. Now, may I speak to Governor Tyree or Skank or whatever he's calling himself? Uh, he stepped away. Stepped away? To where? Don't tell me he left you alone out there. Later, Mom. The reason I clicked off in such a hurry was that I heard a truck honking and a high-pitched scrape of brakes out on the road not far from our campfire. Using the flashlight app, I picked my way through the woods, not even trying to be quiet. By the time I reached the road, the truck was out of sight. Shards of oyster shells littered the pavement. I called out for the governor, sweeping my little flashlight back and forth. The glow fell upon a boot, an exceptionally large boot, standing empty on the gravel shoulder. I saw that the toe of the boot had been crushed, practically flattened. A grimy, torn sock lay crumpled nearby. When I yelled again, my voice cracked. A froggy reply came from out of the darkness. Over here, son, followed by a gusher of swear words. I aimed the light toward a ditch, and that's where he was sprawled. His bare right foot looked crooked and pulpy. What happened? I cried. Not as quick as it used to be. That's what happened. Here, hold this. No way. It was a baby skunk, and I didn't have to look twice to be sure. A skunk the size of a guinea pig, but still a skunk, stripes and alls. Stripes and all. Do what I say, Skink growled. Stay calm and she won't spray. And kill that freaking light. 
So I cr cradled the little stinker in the crook of my arm while the governor gimped out of a ditch and retrieved his boot, which no longer fit over his mangled toes. The skink didn't make a sound. The, sorry, the skunk didn't make a sound, but I could feel it tremble. We are not eating her, I said. Don't be a nitwit, Richard. Richard. If I'd wanted to eat her, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Turned out that the baby skunk had been crossing the road behind its mother when an 18-wheeler came speeding down the hill. Skunks have poor eyesight, so they never saw what was coming. The mama made it safely to the other side, but the small one was too slow. The governor had dropped the oyster shells, dashed into the road, snatched up the youngster, and then tried to leap out of the way. The truck missed everything but his right foot. Now he was limping ahead of me through the trees. I didn't need the flashlight app to see which way he was going. I just followed the ripe smell of oysters. He was looking for the mother skunk, and somehow he tracked her down. It was impressive. He said she wouldn't spray us with musk if we talked softly, and she didn't. He took the little skunk from me and set it, her on the ground. The critter was so blind that he had to spin her around until she was pointed toward the mother. Off they went, two black bushy tails trundling single file through the scrub. The governor was in a world of pain, grunting and cussing as he hopped along. I found a sturdy stick for him to use as a walking cane, but he was still breathing hard and shining with sweat by the time we reached the road. Damn polecats, he grumbled. Richard, there's a well-known well known saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Don't you believe in karma? I do. You're not the one walking on broken toes. A pair of low-set headlights appeared at the top of the hill. It was definitely a car, not a truck, and it was approaching at high speed. Skink told me to get in the ditch and stay down. I asked why. In case it's the sheriff or a game warden, he said impatiently. I don't feel like trying to explain what we're doing out here in the boonies in the dead of night. Once they see my run over foot, they'll call an ambulance and send me straight to emergency. Well, that's where you need to be. He gave me a push toward the ditch. No detour, son. We got work to do. He slid down beside me, removing his shower cap so that the oncoming lights wouldn't catch the shine of the plastic. The car was easily doing 60 as it sped past, but we peeked up just in time for a glimpse. It wasn't a police cruiser. It was a light-colored Toyota. That's a Camry, Skink asked. Or a Corolla? I couldn't tell. It was going way too fast. I didn't get a look at the rear windshield. Did you see a pellet hole? No, it was going too fast, I said again. The only thing I saw clearly was the chrome logo on the trunk, a circle with two small ovals linked crossways inside. I recognized it because my father once had a Toyota minivan. Skink said this model was definitely a two-door. That's what we're looking for, right? Yep. I was ready to jump out of my skin. I was so excited. The governor struggled upright and got himself back on the back back out on the road. Northbound, he muttered, peering at the vanishing taillights. Maybe you're right about that baby skunk. Maybe she brought us some luck. I stood beside him on the center line, wondering if I was watching my cousin fade out of sight and out of reach. Then hurry, let's go, I practically shouted. Come on! You make a splint while I douse the fire and pack our stuff. He laughed ruefully. Sounds like a fine plan, Richard, except for one small problem. What now? You know how to drive? Of course I don't. I'm not old enough. Lesson number one. Skink waggled his smashed boot in the air. It's the right foot that goes back and forth between the gas pedal and the brake. Oh, God. I felt like throwing up. Can't you do it, lefty? Too tricky, he explained. Plus, I'm in a severe amount of discomfort. Mr. Tile always kept proper medication in the first aid kit, but it'll leave me unfit to operate heavy machinery, like a Chevy Malibu. Correct. The governor hobbled back through the woods toward our campfire. I stepped ahead of him, light, lighting the way with my LED. What if Mally was in that car, I said miserably. We can't just sit here roasting s'mores until your stupid foot gets better. No, son, we'll continue the pursuit. Every step caused him to wince. But we can't go anywhere if you're too crippled to drive. From now on, you'll be our driver, Richard. I'll teach you how. Tonight? No way. In the dark? I don't think I can deal with that. Relax, he said. The highways of this state are teeming with mental defectives. Gee, thanks. All I'm saying is that anyone can do it. I could get arrested. Underage, with no license. Mom would go totally ballistic if I had to call her from jail. Nobody in this vehicle will be getting arrested. 
Skink stated this as a concrete fact. I wasn't scared of trying to drive a car, but I was nervous, super nervous, to be honest. The circumstances weren't exactly ideal. Broad daylight in the empty parking lot of a football stadium, no problem. Pitch black night on a winding country road, different story. From behind, I felt a friendly poke from the governor's walking stick. You'll do fine, he said. I'll even let you put on your own music.